You ready? This is to get you in the mood. This is a hard one. as we allow the vibration of the heart bowl to resonate within us, we feel that energy center at the point of our heart open up, open up to receive, open up to flow. And from that place, we recognize the presence of the divine, that absolute, all-encompassing, perfect, beautiful, amazing presence. It is that presence which we are. It is that presence which is the cause point of all that exists. It exists in us. It exists moving through us. It exists as us right here and right now. And with that knowing, we move into this exploration of how to access that and use that to have the life that we so desire to have. We come together tonight to explore this idea of awakening to the true power that we have within us to use in every thought, in every action. <coughs> we come together to do the good work of awakening to our spiritual magnificence. And from that knowing, our lives change. They be, we become clearer we become more aligned with the ideas and purpose and meaning of our lives. Things get better. This is the nature of awakening. So we come together to awaken, and all is well. All is good, because all is God. And in gratitude for this knowing, to the depths of our very being, we say thank you to life. We say thank you to love. And let it be so. Releasing it into the allness and allow it to reflect back with everything that we see, touch, taste, smell, and know. And so it is. And so, so it is. is. Thank you. You turn those lights back on. What's that now? I'm not sure what the key is. I know it really works. Hi, everybody. I am not Dr. Barbara. Oh, I couldn't tell. Dr. Barbara has taken the night off. Good for her. She was ready. Although she was planning to be here, I said, Barbara, you don't have to do this. I know how to teach. So she's making soup. Nice. So uh, the, the subject tonight is spiritual mind treatment. How many of you use spiritual mind treatment as a daily spiritual practice? Great. Okay. And those of you that didn't raise your hand, maybe you'll consider it today. It could happen. So um, we've got to do some preliminary stuff before we get too far into this idea of treatment. Uh, one is that we've got to be clear about the idea of mind, and I know Barbara's been working with you on that. You've been drawing circles with lines and bees and what look like bees and, and, and exploring a lot of that. 
Um, but tonight we're going to uh, maybe touch on some of that to draw us to, into this idea of spiritual mind treatment. Uh, what Ralph Waldo Emerson said, there is one mind common to all. Meaning that's all there is, is there's, there's the mind that we use and it is all, all the same mind. Now it seems different because I have a different thought than you do. But that's because we have, we live in this illusion of separateness. But the fact is that if you have a thought, that's the divine thought that flows through you. You may take ownership of it, but the fact is, is that it belongs to the universe. And that's true with every thought you've ever had and every thought you ever will. And those thoughts that you have obviously are more than just passing images or passing notions. They are truly the things that we create with. And that's why we, we call it spiritual mind treatment. So there's two things that we do as spiritual beings. They're the same two things that spirit does because it's all the same. Anybody know what those two things are? Oh, Joe has an idea. Cool. Think and express and experience. That's it. Express. Oh, you must have read my book. <laughs> yeah, express and experience. And uh, that seems pretty simplistic, but it's true. Is there anything you do that is, that is neither an expression that you make into the world or an experience that you take in? Doesn't everything fall into one of those two? Great. So that's the nature of spirit. And the beauty of that is that obviously as created beings that we are, the nature of spirit, we create out, we express out into the world, and then we experience that expression coming back to us as, as an experience. And everything falls into, into that divine flow. Everything. The question is, how do you get the things in that flow of expression and experience to be the things you want instead of the things you don't want? And that's what makes this spiritual practice, uh, let's see, it makes it uh, something that you can discipline yourself to do. So if any of you still, and I know it's all of you, still have moments where you don't like what's happening in your life, that's because you're still working on disciplining yourself to have the thoughts that will create the experience that you want. That's all we're doing. It's really that simple. Does that make sense? We're all on the same page so far? Good. So, the thing that we do as a spiritual practice is, is prayer. That's what, we, that's what we do. We call it spiritual mind treatment, and we can go into why. But the idea is, is that there are moments when we focus more clearly than we do normally. And mostly in our day, in, our, in the minutia of life, we're, we're experiencing uh, life, and we're dealing with stuff, and, and it's details, and it's minutia, and it's, it's grandkids, and it's students, and it's co-workers, and it's traffic, and it's all that stuff. And most of the time, we're in a state of, uh, of reactivity. We're just kind of reacting to it as though it's coming at us. And, and in that way, we're not really taking any responsibility for it. We're not saying, I'm creating this. And that's a, an interesting thing. That, that when you start to realize that that experience of what's coming in changes based on the expression that you're sending out. There has to be an absolute balance with that. That's why two people can be in the same traffic and one is having a delightful experience and the other one is, is you know, life sucks. It's the same traffic. It's the same thing. They're just experiencing it different because it has to go through all of your, your uh, filters and, and that's based on what you believe and how you respond to life. So, and, and I'm not saying that you're, that you're not having a direct impact on it, you are. On everything that's happening, your consciousness is, is impacting everything that's coming into your experience, out of what you've expressed in your thoughts and your actions. You know, all is about you. It's all about you. Anybody who tells you it's not about you, they're wrong. It's all about you. And the beauty of that is, is that if you don't like what's happening, you can change it. I got that real quick when I came into this kitchen. I loved it. I remember I was in, uh, bless your heart, you've heard this a thousand times. Um, I, I was uh, working at the Crystal Cathedral in uh, Garden Grove, California. I was invited to be one of the facilitators of, of an event out there. 
and there was a guy named Bill Wilson, how about that for me, uh, who was a minister, a, um, oh, I don't remember what it was, Church of Christ, Seventh-day Adventist, something like that, who had this remarkable church in Brooklyn, New York, that was there speaking to the group. And uh, he, did, he did Sunday on, Sunday school on Saturday and sent out about 60 buses all across Brooklyn to pick up kids and bring them into this, what looked like a television studio. Uh, uh, and they did things that, like, that seemed like a game show. But then there was always this amazing lesson that they would give to all these kids that would show up. It was brilliant. Anyway, his point was to all these ministers and rabbis and Muslim clerics in Los Angeles or in Southern California uh, that particular day was that the reason there were riots happening as far back it was, the reason there were riots happening in, uh, in L.A. was because of the churches. How much do you think all those ministers wanted to hear that? <laughs> so they're cringing. But I'm in the back of the room, and I'm going, yeah! And they're looking at me like, who are you? And I'm thinking, if he says you did this, you can change it. That's the big thing. So anytime you feel like you're being blamed, or you're blaming yourself for what's going on in your life, which is where a lot of people go with this teaching. They go, ah, I really messed up. I did this terrible thing, and now my life is dull. No, 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 no. If you created that, you can create something else very easily. The same way, just do something, think differently. Have a different thought, a real thought, a conscious thought of, of, of a high awareness that, that is different than the thing you thought before, and you'll get a different result. It will change. I've had times in my life where insurmountable odds were before me. A wall so high I couldn't see the top. I didn't know what to do. But when I figured out I could change what I was thinking, the wall just dissipated into nothingness and I stepped forward. You know, that's, that's the way it works. If you think it doesn't, then you're living in your smallness. And if you realize that anything that you want to achieve in your life can be done if you're willing to change your thinking and your perception of it in the way you... you are expressing out your, your perceived experience of it. If you shift your consciousness on that, you will get a different result. Something will change. Something will happen. I've, I've had an interesting one uh, that I've been working on for five years, and I have to swear all of you to, uh, uh, to uh, absolute confidence. And Judith, you've got to turn the thing off for a minute. Will do. And I love to do this. <laughs> we're back. And we're back. <laughs> and it was really nothing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that by holding that intent, I had to get clear. How many of you saw the movie Shawshank Redemption? Remember when he would go in to the to the board that would decide whether or not he could he could be released? And he'd, he'd be, oh, yes, sir, I can do this, and I'll be a good one, and blah, blah, blah. And they would never let him out. And finally we told him, I don't care what you do. He was done with it. He wasn't going to play their game anymore. They let him out. You know? That's how it works. He wasn't invested in it. He didn't have to have it. He knew what, who he was. And he moved forward in his life. And that's kind of what this little thing was in my life, is that I needed to, uh, uh, to get clear. And I did. And I gave an entirely different take in my application information. And it came back the way I wanted five years ago. But trust me, nothing you get in your life is based on your wanting it. Wanting only points in a direction. It does not accomplish or achieve anything. So what we use spiritual mind treatment for is as a tool to get us through the process of being in the state that expresses the thing that we want to experience. It's not the wanting. So, and and I'm, I'm not making wanting wrong. Never want to do that. But you have to understand, all the wanting does is point you in a direction, like a compass. It tells you where you want to go. It has nothing to do with you achieving or accomplishing anything. Oh, I desired it so much, I finally got it. No. It's about having the consciousness of having the thing that you want. That's how you get it. So we're going to look at how to do that tonight. Um, a friend of mine, Greg Brady, wrote a book a few years ago called uh, The Secret 
uh, the lost, I'm going to have to that for you, secret, Secrets of the Lost Mode of Prayer. Ever heard of that? Yes. Little bitty book, yes. little red book, lovely little book. And just, he lays it out so beautifully. You know, if you know Greg Braden, he's, a, he's an engineer by trade, but he's gotten on this spiritual path, and he just goes all over the planet checking stuff out. And what he spent a lot of time doing was going into archives of, uh, in, in Tibet and in South America and looking at what the, the ancient writings were of the, of the mystics, you know, what he could find that still exists. And he came up with this idea that there's a lost mode of prayer. Uh, prayer is the, is the thing that we use to direct ourselves, to move into a, a higher level of consciousness. And he said that there are, there are four well-known and used modes of prayer. And they are. Uh, the first one is called bargaining. <laughs> We've all done it. Okay, God, if you, if you just give this to me, let this happen. I promise I will always do no, 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 or I will never again do no, 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 no. You know, we're making a deal with the divine. It's a clever idea, and we do it out of desperation. Does it work? I can't say that it absolutely doesn't work. I can just say it's not the most effective way to do, to do prayer work. Uh, because anytime that you're desperate and up against a wall uh, and feeling that way, usually that's not your strongest position. So, we've got bargain. The second one is called petitioning prayer. And that's pretty, pretty straightforward. It's asking. <coughs> it's just asking God to give you something. You know, and doing it in lovely words, like, you know, calling God Heavenly Father and all those <laughs> things that we all grew up with. Uh, most of us, anyway. Not you, David. Uh, but most of us grew up with the idea that we would petition God because this is really important and, and we want God to know that we, we told this is very important and blah, blah, blah. Is that an effective way to do it? I think that's probably the least effective way to do it because we're giving absolutely all of our power to an outside entity to see if we can have it. Not a strong position. Kind of got to go with the whims of, the, of this, whatever mood God's in that day. Right? So you don't get very far with it. The third one's called ritual prayer. And that's a prayer of atonement. And that's common in some of the older uh, uh, disciplines of, of religion, like the Catholic Church. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord be with you. Uh, and whatever else the words are that go with that. And say over and over and over. Because obviously I did something I shouldn't have done. And this is my penance. This is my way out. And that's, that's, uh, that's a prayer of uh, uh, a ritual prayer. And then we have a meditative prayer. And some would say meditation isn't really a prayer because uh, meditating is trying to get quiet enough, still enough, that you can be aware of the void, which, which the great meditating masters say is where the divine rests. Oh, oh the lost man. Oh, who's here? <laughs> wow. okay. Not a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Judith. <laughs> Does make her happy to come in the day. <laughs> Makes me happy for her. Did she go out, Judith? Yeah, uh, all by herself. Great, all by herself? <laughs> I trash took her. Got it. She finished the job. So the idea of meditation uh, being a, uh, a, a way to gain awareness of the presence by being quiet enough to get it, which is, is cool. And you know, I've known a lot of people that are deeply disciplined in their meditation. And I think it probably calms them down a little bit. Um, it doesn't make them any better than anyone else at being, at being consciously spiritual. So uh, I, I've spent my share of time meditating. It's a valid, valuable uh, uh, discipline. And it's used by people all over the planet for all kinds of reasons and all kinds of ways. Sometimes you're, you do it when you're walking. Sometimes you do it staring at a flame. Sometimes you do it in a absolute science, silence, sometimes you do it with background, uh, music, all kinds of ways to meditate, not right or wrong, just ways that people use that discipline. And then there's the last one, the fifth one. What could that be? Well, according to uh, uh, Brayton, uh, the lost modality is found in many ancient spiritual practices and has several characteristics. One is knowing that the outcome desired already exists. 
the outcome already exists. Let me tell you that that is the essence of spiritual mind treatment. If you're doing treatment the way it is designed, you come out of the treatment knowing with absolute certainty that the outcome that you are desiring already exists. So, great, we found the lost one, and that's ours, and that's the one that we use. So, the question is, how does this work, this, this using this idea that what we are, are desiring already exists? And living in a place and being in a state of consciousness of knowing that it already exists. I have a quote from a guy named Roy Eugene Davis. Anybody ever heard of him? Old guy. Lives outside of Atlanta. Studied with uh, Maharishi, I believe. Yogananda. Yogananda, thank you. That's right. Uh, and, and he's quite a great teacher. Even in, uh, he's got to be in his 90s. He was old when I got into science of mind. <laughs> anyway, he wrote this and it really applies. We pray to God when we think or feel that we are separate from God. When we know God, we pray in God, understanding that prayer is a matter of consciousness, interacting only with itself until higher understanding prevails. One may pray to any concept of God. The results will be in accord with the conviction of one's state and the degree of the sur surrender of one's illusional sense of selfhood. Although we may pray for improvements of mundane circumstances, the most satisfying experience is realization of God's wholeness in which nothing is lacking. That kind of, that kind of nails it. And Holmes says, uh, the power is not so much in the statements we use as it is in the consciousness our words induce. They help us to become aware of that which already exists. So what we're going for in, in treatment is not to create something. Although, golly, don't we say it all the time. Look what I created. And you could argue that you did create it because you're the one that, that it began with in the inception by you having the thought. But what you're doing is not actually creating something uh, uh, out, of, out of the ethers. You're actually revealing it by, by saying it's so, by knowing that it's so. And how many of us have brought all kind of garbage into our lives mm -hmm. because we claim it is so? Mm -hmm. I know this is going to hurt. What, what do you think the chances are it's going to hurt? <laughs> I knew I, I was going to lose that. Well, if you knew that, well, you were right. You were going to lose it. I think it was Henry Ford that said, uh, you can win or you can lose either way, depending on what you think. You're right. You know, that was a paraphrase. But the idea is, is that we're the ones that are determining the outcome we're going to experience based on what we think. And don't think it's what you say out loud that has any more power than what you're thinking in your mind without ever saying it out loud. That is every bit, if not more powerful. I've seen lots of people that, you know, that, that do treatments or do affirmations and say it over and over and over again, but they don't believe it. So if you don't believe it, you know, the universe doesn't believe it either. It doesn't believe you're ready to experience it. So, uh, uh, and, and there's that thing of, of uh, uh, pretend until you get there, but... The truth is, is that, that the relevance of it is that it comes forth when you can know that it's so. And that's the way Holmes did his treatment work. He would sit in his, in his library, close the door, and sit in there for hours working on one thing. It wasn't like he, you know, he, he did a one-minute miracle like we do. He, he sat with it until he was absolutely convinced that what he, what he was calling forth was so, that it was already so. <coughs> And by doing that, his ability to, to have the outcome he desired was, was amazing. I mean, he, he, he was doing it all over the place, but not flippantly. He, he had to do the same work that everybody else does. He had to go sit quietly and get clear and do his dream and work. That's where the power is. You know, not just, not just slapping your jaw. That's not what it's about. It's really about getting it and knowing it. The idea of treatment is to convince yourself it's so, is to absolutely, completely be committed to the knowing that this is so, whatever it is, whatever it is. And by doing that, you get the outcome that you desire. Anything short of that, hit and miss. So everybody, we want to get to the place where you got this down. And when you use it, when you speak those words or when you think those thoughts, 
that you're committed to them. You know that that's absolutely the truth. That's what you're looking for. That's where you're going with this. So you know that spiritual mind treatment has five steps. We're aware of that? Okay, we're going to go through the five steps. But before we do, I, I want to ask a question. How many of you have you uh, have played chess in your life? Okay, good number of people. Any of you a master of chess? <laughs> could yeah. be. We could have a master in the room. There you master go. Master <laughs> So how many of you believe that have played chess believe that you had the full concept of the game as soon as you knew how all the, uh, the, uh, uh, the pieces moved? <laughs> That's just enough to get you in trouble, right? So don't don't think more tonight that you're going to have treatment down. It's the same thing. It has taken me 30 years to get where I am with this. I'm sure you can get there faster than me. But at the same time, don't think that you've got this down and handled and that you can do it because you know how to speak the five steps. That's just knowing how the pieces move on the chessboard. Then you have to move into how to really hone that, that ability to move your mind, to move those ideas to a different place that they'll stay. Here's another piece of the puzzle. We don't create, well, even if, if we did create, you can't create and one time and have it be that way forever. It's like the idea in Christianity that God created the heavens and the earth. Whatever intelligent force is behind the creation of physical form, it's still creating it. Every single one. It doesn't stop. It's not like, okay, that's done. Let's go off to something else and it'll just keep working. No. Creation is a constant state of unfolding. So if you're going, and, and, but the, th the lovely thing about it is, is that once you are absolutely convinced it's so, that thought is in your consciousness, and it continues to operate. So if you are absolutely convinced that something is so, it's good. As long as you know it's so, and you have no doubts and no concerns and no confusion around it, it'll keep creating itself that way. It'll keep showing up like that. It'll keep being revealed that way. <clears throat> but if you forget, if you get scared, if you uh, uh, are distracted and have another thought, you get a different result. Has anybody ever talked to you about Willard Fuller? Yes. Willard Fuller was a faith healer that I met when I went to the Miami church uh, certainly almost 30 years ago. He was this uh, six foot four, white, long white hair, shoulder length or longer big white beard, spoke with a Louisiana accent. He was a Baptist minister, and he was a faith healer. And he was the one that actually helped me move in consciousness from believing that anything was possible to actually experience things that were impossible. Because what he would do is he would come and work with groups of people, tell his stories about the healings that happen around him, and then invite everyone to come forward and receive a blessing. And it was really simple. He would touch people on the sides of their face and say, in the name of Jesus, be thy every whittle. Old English talk. But it was a blessing. And then everyone would sit down and things would start popping. People would suddenly have uh, fillings in their mouths where they hadn't been before. Their fillings, for some people, would turn from, from amalgam to, to gold. Uh, people would have teeth moved. I mean, most, the, and he said people were having uh, experiences of healing all through their bodies, but the ones you could see were in the mouth. But most of the stories he told were about healings in the mouth, so that's kind of where our minds went. Uh, and uh, the, the night that I met him, uh, I actually had three fillings appear in my mouth. Hmm. Out of nowhere. It was amazing. Yes? My mother had gold fillings. So there you go. Yeah. And the reason I brought it up was. Uh, uh, one of the ministers down there in Miami had his feelings turned to gold. And every morning he would get up and take his flashlight into the bathroom and lick in his mouth. And look at this. They were gold. They were gold. And they were gold. And then one day they weren't. And he said, I knew they were going to change back. <laughs> there you go. So if you hold a thought, a fear, 
that even though you've created something brilliant in your life, something wonderful has come forward because you have shifted in consciousness. Don't think it has to always be that way. You know, that's no guarantee. It's not like it's created and it's going to stay forever. It's a constant knowing. It's a consciousness thing. And it's not that you have to think about it every day. But if you hold the thought, and when you do think about it, that's what comes up, that that's handled. That's what you get. When I do treatment work for somebody, especially around health things, especially someone here in the community, when I see them on Sunday, I go, how's the healthiest person I know? How's the, how's the person with the, the strongest legs I, I do it? You know, or I'll say something like that to them, because when I see them, I remember that we treated knowing that they were healthy. We treated knowing that uh, that, that, that injury or that pain was, didn't exist. It was gone. It wasn't there. We, I mean, we didn't treat that way, but that was the, the outcome that was desired, was health and wholeness. And that means that when I look at them, that's what I have to think. And it worked. It worked, it's worked every time for me. And, you know, usually I get a chuckle from somebody on Sunday when I say that. But I'm doing my work. I'm keeping that thought absolutely alive in me, knowing that with him. But like the minister I was telling you about, anyone can do, have treatment work done for them or even do it for themselves and get an outcome, get a demonstration, and have it go back. Maybe even to something that's more challenging than they had before. That it's really a matter of consciousness. That's the work. So doing five steps of treatment is about shifting your consciousness. That's the point. We have any questions yet? Yes. Well, I just had the thought in the old magic traditions. You always reset your boards every full moon. Uh, that was like a cycle that people use, you know, to reaffirm their desire. Oh, that's a great idea. Anything, any system that allows you to to reinforce a state of consciousness is valuable. And I'm sure that uh, the, the Wiccans and uh, all the folks that are in the rhythms of the planet and the universe are probably pretty good at that stuff. You know, so yay, absolutely. You know, whatever it takes, whatever, whatever you want to do. That's why often when you learn affirmations, there's such value in posting them around the house, in the bathroom mirror, or in your car, or somewhere where you're just, you have to think about it. And you have to think about it in terms that support you. Because that's what you wrote it, put there in front of you somewhere. So the idea is you want that thought to be reinforced all the time. And it doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense that thinking about it would actually cause it to be in your life. But that's exactly how it works. It doesn't work any other way. Uh, Barbara's uh, first mother-in-law was a Catholic. And uh, uh, she was Italian. And, and she would pray to a particular saint. And she would light a green candle and pray to this saint. And she said every time she did, whatever she prayed for came to her. Okay, why not? You want to do it that way? That's great. Although, not long before her death, I asked, Barbara asked her, we were at with, with her in her home, and, and asked her how it was going with that saint. She says, ah, it doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so, you know, but however you want to do it. <laughs> but for her, it, through much of her life, that was the way that she created it. And she, she had the thought that it worked. And as long as she had the thought that it worked, it would work. Until it didn't. Anyway. Um, and, and being as we're, we're still talking in nuances, I want to give you one other interesting little thing that I love to teach when I teach treatment. Well, look, we don't have anything to write with here. Yes, <laughs> wow, where's she like that? Did I spell it right? Yeah. Oh, good. Anybody know what that means? Pan means all. Theism means God. God is all. That's exactly what it means. That's a... a That's an area of thought that says that whatever you can see, whatever you can experience, whatever there is in the universe is God. And in our teaching, we kind of figured out that maybe that was a limiting thought. 
So another idea was was brought forward. Panentheism. Very close, but it has a different meaning. Panentheism means everything is in God. Because the universe can actually be a finite concept. It might have edges. Even if it's expanding at the speed of light, it, it may actually have edges. That would make it finite. So if, you, if, you're, if you're thinking in terms of the panentheist, or the pantheist, you're actually, and saying that everything is God, or that God is everything, you're actually having a, a limiting thought. Where the idea that <coughs> the divine is an infinite, it has no edges, it has no limitation, and that the universe exists within it. Now you have the possibility of multi multiverses. Now you have the possibility of whatever it is, exists in this thing that ha has no limitation. And it's actually a more powerful place to be. Because if I'm going to be uh, the divine in either of those two models, I want the second one. So, and, and just for fun, let me tell you who's in these different camps. Uh, the Taoists uh, would be pan pantheists. Uh, poets, uh, Wordsworth, Whitman, Thoreau, D.H. Lawrence, all pantheists. Uh, Einstein, pantheist. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, the great architect, pantheist. Carl Sagan, billions and billions of stars, uh, 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 was a pantheist. And so James Cameron, the guy, the movie guy. Uh, pantheist is a different camp. Uh, that would include Plato, Meister Eckhart, Spinoza, my favorite, <coughs> uh, my favorite philosopher, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Ernest Holmes, and uh, all the Gnostic Christians would be in that camp. So it's just it's it's kind of just a nuance, but I think it really takes us to a clearer idea. And it keeps us in our treatment from doing our first step as a pantheist that says, God is the trees, God is the ocean, God is the sky. No, don't do that. That's a limiting thought. All of those things exist within that. So as we move into step one, that's the thing to watch for is not to have limiting thoughts in your first step, but to have them be expansive. You can't go all the way, but you can certainly begin with that. So we do. We have, we have five steps. Recognition. What would we be recognizing? Actually, that is not what we're doing because that would be pan pantheist. Oh, okay. So no, no, don't be sorry. It's okay. It's just that's that's the game. That's the thing I want you to kind of catch yourself and and avoid. Okay. We're recognizing Existence. divine presence, yeah. okay. right? Now, can anyone here uh, absolutely recognize divine presence? Then obviously you shouldn't be in a body. <laughs> Well, you're, you're certainly <laughs> acting like it over there. So, uh, I don't think you can. I don't think you in your human capacity, nor I in my human capacity, can fully realize and recognize the presence well, of the divine. I, I know, you think that. I know. And I have experienced that as being the void of the all, the container of everything. And even though I am now, as an ego, in this position, I remember what that is, and it gave me a total knowing of that I am God. So good for you. I, that's me. Ah, good for you. Okay, the rest of us. Uh, here's the deal: we move toward an understanding of the divine. We seek to know it, but I I don't think any of us get that fully experience that full experience in the human experience that it is something to pursue. It is a direction, not a destination. That's my, that's my understanding of that. I don't do as a limitation. I do to say that I must continuously seek to know this, that I cannot rely on a memory, that I cannot rely upon some understanding, that I must continuously work in that first step of recognition to recognize the presence. So it's the journey? 
Yeah, it's a, it's something that we are forever doing. You know, it's like, and frankly, everybody that sits in a monastery somewhere has this task. That's their job. And the idea is that most people who are truly committed to that don't leave the monastery. They stay there because they're still in that pursuit. And it's a blissful pursuit. It's a wonderful pursuit. But the idea is never be satisfied. Never be satisfied. Never think you've got this figured out. Pursue it. Seek. So I've had some wonderful people in this teaching that do their first step knowing that God is all there is, or even that all exists within the mind of God, which is, it may or may not be accurate statements, but the deepest understanding of that is what? How do you get to that? You know? So, that, so my way of being with that is to always reach a little farther. And one way to do that is to not to use the same words every time you do a treatment. I've had some people say, oh, no, I just say those same words because they put me in a state. Well, they put you in a state that isn't as far as you can go. I want you to go farther. I want you to reach out. Get a sense of what the divine is right now. And let that be something greater and more glorious than what you did earlier, yesterday or this afternoon. You know, take it to a deeper place. And it's not the words. That's why we have to go over this again and again and again. We learn how to use words. Words are a delivery system, but they are inadequate. So one might say that, that the place to find that is in, is in meditative work. Yet in spiritual mind treatment, we are expressing. And we are, as, as an extrovert, this is perfect for me because I like to treat out loud, and I hear my words, and I use them to take me to a place of understanding. And I'm never completely at the final destination. I'm always in pursuit of it. I'm always seeking a greater, a deeper, a more full understanding of the presence. And I have found that incredibly valuable to me. Rather than saying, no, got it, got it figured out. I'll say these words and that'll be it. I find that lacking for me personally. So I offer that to you. Is don't get into a habit if you're going to use this as a spiritual practice. To say the same words every time you do your recognition statement because that will tell you that you are at the same level you were the last time you said those words. So however you do your first statement, your recognizing of divine presence, make it a stretch. Make it a stretch. Make it take you further than you went last time. That make sense? Oops. Maybe I should keep up on my notes. So we do use, to help us do that, there are, there are three concepts that we, that we use to, uh, to begin to get a sense of what that is. And I, I found these actually between the first step and the second step to be incredibly valuable. So the things that we know about the divine that we can continue to pursue an understanding of is that the divine is... present. What does that mean? Yes, Michaela? It means it's everywhere. It means that God is everywhere. That's a good start. The first thing that we get help with on that, though, is that if God is present everywhere, it isn't what many of us as children were told, is that God's watching you means that if God is everywhere, then God must be where you are, too. That there can't be God and you. If, ha if, if, if a presence is, is required, and this says that it absolute presence, then God must be at the point of view. Nothing short of that. Okay. Um, I haven't thought about that. It's gone, so we'll just move on. <laughs> God is omniscient, meaning that God is all what? Knowing. Knowing, yes. 
So if God is all-knowing, then it, that doesn't mean that God knows what you're thinking. It means that God is your thought. Because all-knowing is God. So whatever, oh no, not me, not those thoughts. <laughs> those, those wouldn't be God's thoughts. Those are, those are, no, those are not good thoughts. Well, yeah, all-knowing is God. So whatever you're thinking, those thoughts are God's thoughts. Now, you can take it the other way, and rather than seeing that, that God has mundane or um, <clears throat> obsessive or any other kinds of thoughts, think in terms that when you think clearly, you speak with the authority of the divine, because that idea that is, that is emerging from you is a divine idea in the mind of God. So it allows you actually to be empowered by it. It's not, don't, don't take the, go down the rabbit hole with this and find something less. Move into something greater, knowing that you have the capacity within you to act with the authority of the divine. What is the authority of the, the divine? It's this whole idea that your thought becomes a, your experience, that your expression becomes your experience. That's, that's the divine action. That's how the universe is organized. So when you begin this process of, of thinking consciously, what you're doing is saying that those, those ideas must be the ideas of the divine. And they have the creative essence to be brought into full demonstration, full manifestation. Okay, let's see. And then there's the third one. Omnipotent, meaning <coughs> powerful. Many people in, in more traditional uh, Western religions would, meet, would say that that means that God has some power over you. But that can't be. Because whatever power you have is divine. So your ability to move your, your uh, eyelids, your ability to raise your arm, ability to walk, your ability to have a heart that beats is all the power of the divine. So all power is God. Whatever it is, whether it's a ripple on the on the water or hurricane, it's the power of the divine. It couldn't exist. All animation is, to, is the divine presence. All celestial bodies moving around. Atomic particles moving through space. It's all God. It's, it all exists within the presence of the divine. It's all held in this one presence. So it's everything. It's everywhere. It's all. And it's right here. And that's the beauty of this too because uh, being omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent means, according to Thomas Troward, which I'm sure you'll read and study before this is all over, says that, that the presence of the divine exists in its entirety at every point. At every point. It's not just, oh, the vastness of the divine. It's also the absoluteness of the divine at the point of you. And at every other point. Wow. Oh, it's exactly like a hologram. That's exactly the, the concept. So that the presence of the divine exists wholly at the point of view. The power that created the universe dwells at the point of view. All of your expressions emerge from that absoluteness of the divine. That's some awesome power. So that's the way you can experience the divine. Now, Truer did another thing, and, and uh, Holmes uh, did his little bit on it too, but it's kind of good to see how they, how they came up with this. They, they said that there are, there are attributes that, uh, of spirit, and we, we do a nice thing on Christmas Eve with this, with the seven attributes of spirit. But by all means, don't think that these are the only attributes of spirit. They're just the ones that are really nice to focus on. They're very limiting in their, in their scope. But isn't it nice to have something to focus on when you want to see if you're in alignment with something that is working and expanding and, and functioning in your life? You know, so th these are the ones that Troy and then Holmes came up with. 
put them over here. And does this go under the recognition category? Yep. Because this is, we're still talking about recognition of spirit. That's why I put it over here on the side. So if you're looking for some aspect of the divine that you can easily recognize and attribute as a spiritual, as spiritual nature, these guys are really easy. Now the truth is, is that all the stuff in life you, that you don't like, that you don't want, uh, you know, What's it called when there's no more food? Famine. Famine, <laughs> pestilence, uh, uh, war, murder, all that ugly stuff, that's God too. Because it can't be anything else. But what we want to do is we want to focus on the thing, the way we want to experience life. So, so Thomas Jordan and Ernest Holmes used these kinds of ideas as the essence of the divine so, so we have something to focus on. <clears throat> and that's a great idea. So these, these are, are set to be the things that you can always get through, and you can go through them and say, so how they, if, if, they're, if they're absolute, if they, if they meet the criteria of being in, in, in this omnipresence, omniscience, and omnipotence, then, then that works. So where do you start peace? Well, how can you say peace is omnipotent because there's war? Well, here's the deal. Uh, all the studies that are coming out now tell us that we are much more at peace in the world than we are at war. That what's different is that we have this high level of information coming at us. You know, and we've got what's how many billion people on the planet now? Seven? Seven. Something like that. Yeah. And a hundred and a few people were were slaughtered in Paris last week, and the world goes into a major panic. Now, not to say that there's not something there at all, and not, not to uh, uh, understate uh, uh, the value of those lives. That, you know, that's heartbreaking. That's something. There's seven billion of us. Most of us are at peace. But the media gives us this hype about what happened in Paris, and we all go, oh gosh, the world's coming apart. <clears throat> you know, one of the things I read on Facebook after it happened is, uh, oh, hundred and whatever people died in Paris. And, and that same day, 13,000 children died in the world from starvation. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are we looking at here? Okay, we're finding our way. Nothing about that is, is, is not worth looking at. At the same time, most of the world is at peace. And over time, we are becoming more and more peaceful. We are just becoming more aware of the violence of the world. So, peace is the natural state. Power is the natural state. We, I mean, that's what we're talking about tonight, how powerful we are as spiritual beings. We are unlimited in our ability to create our lives. That is, is awesome power. Most of us don't use it. Most people on the planet haven't a clue. They think that life happens to them. And we're learning that we're actually creating our lives. Beauty. Beauty is, is a perception, but if you take the time to look, there's beauty everywhere. Joy. My guess is that there's more joy in the world than there is fear. And that that's the way we, that, that life is continuing to evolve, is that's what's showing up, love, light, and wisdom, the same kind of thing. So the idea here is, is where are you putting your attention? Use your spiritual mind treatment to make certain you're putting your attention toward the elements of life you want to experience. That's why you have that list. And, and with that, I think we're going to take a break. And we'll come back and do the other first step. <laughs> okay, we got step one down. And now it's time to, to move to step two. Um, actually, step two, the, tr the traditional name that most people give it is unification. I struggle with that term. Because how if, if one of the one of the things that we use to describe the divine is a unity, which in our language doesn't really even work, because if if something is a unity, it's the only thing that exists, so there can't be another unity. So the word a doesn't really work. 
but play with it inside the, the, the limitations of language. If God is a unity, how do you unify with it? You can't, because it's already what it is. So some have tried to explain to me that it's actually a process of being aware of the unity of, of, of spirit. Still, the word unification I struggle with. I prefer the word identification. I want to identify with and as that presence. Now this is, some people tell me, easy. I experience it as the, uh, the, the place where most people trip up. Because they are more comfortable with the idea that they've got their lives and God's over there. It's, it, it just shifts everything. It's like people who go, oh, God is all there is. Or all exists within the presence of the divine but not me, because I'm a mess, you know, or I'm that, that, I just don't feel like I'm that. Well, it doesn't come out that natural. I think it does when you're not in a body. And if we're infinite beings, we probably spend lots of, even, I don't even know if there's time when you're not in a body, maybe there isn't. But there's got to be a point where, when we, we are not in a body, that we recognize that presence as us. I just can't see how you couldn't in that state. But in the state of having a body, you identify in the physical. You see separation. It looks like we're different. So there must be something that separates us from this infinite presence, too. But really, it can't. Because if God is all there is, then that has to be who we are. It has to be. There can't be anything else. It just does, it doesn't equate. It's impossible. So, if the presence of the divine is the infinite, absolute presence of the universe, beyond the universe, it contains this universe and who knows how many more, then it must be what we are. So, the task is to start getting a sense of that. And one thing that it takes to get there for me is to understand the concept of perfection. Most people think that perfection means that something turned out the way I imagined it would. That's perfect. <laughs> that is a very, very limited perception of perfection. <clears throat> For me, the great perception of perfection, that could be a tongue twister, yes. <laughs> is to understand that what you think is perfectly transformed into your experience without exception. Now, some people don't want to own that. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't think about getting cancer. I didn't think about getting a divorce. I didn't think about losing a job. But something in your consciousness allowed that to be experienced. So somewhere in your consciousness, the experience you're having right now and every, in every moment of your life came from some expression in your consciousness. Not separate from you. As you. Now, that's not a blaming statement. That's an empowering statement. Because if that's so, you can have a different thought. You can shift your consciousness. You are absolutely in charge of your consciousness. And you can shift it and get a different result. So that's a statement of empowerment. So when you think about perfection, don't think about that you had an idea of how something was going to be, and this is what showed up. What showed up is perfect. It's exactly what your consciousness called for. Called for. That's what you get, because that's who you are. I often tell people, you don't get what you want. You don't even get what you, you don't get what you want. You don't get what you need. That's it. In fact, it's the other way around. Don't get what you need. You don't even get what you want. You get who you are. You get what you are? Yeah. Or who you are. Yeah, always. Everything fits perfectly into your consciousness. And that's never a blaming thing. That's an empowering thing. Always. You're never, you're never less than. You're always more. Yes. Okay. Now, on recognition, the the quote unquote definition was divine presence. Uh, what is is there a short phrase like that for the identification? God is, I am. So this is what this is the step that kind of changes the dynamic in the traditional Judeo-Christian. Uh, model. You've got God. You've got human. Us. 
What's the other part of the triangle? The Satan. That's the traditional model. So this one tries to get you, and you ask to be saved and, and helped, and this one saves you somehow. And this one, this one doesn't like this one. But they are kind of part of some balancing act in, in the drama of the model. But we don't have to play that game anymore. That's not real. The, the reality of life is that there is there's only this. That's it. There's God. It's all there. And even though we use a circle to define it, it's a pretty good circle, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we use, we use uh, uh, the, uh, the limited concept to define it. The, uh, the idea is, is that there's, there's really no separation. Even though when we use this model, of course, we put these two lines in it. But that's not a separation of physicality. Everything physical is here. Everything that we are as spirit is here. And this is the mechanism that moves it from the, the infinite and invisible presence of the divine into physical form. That's what that's about. That's the whole game. That's the whole idea. So there's no one to go to war with you. There's no one against us. There's nothing against us. There's, there's you know, it, we, we, we can play that game, but I have to tell you, and not blaming them, but places in the world where there is war and terrorism and violence are places where people are afraid and where people are, are seeking to, to reach out and hurt. The only people they will hurt are people who are either going to war against them, challenging them, or afraid of them. That's it. And, and that is a, 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 a scenario of, of choice. And you go, well, the children don't, possibly. At some level, yes. You know, one of the big questions that always comes up in these classes is, what about, um, what about the Nazis? Weren't they bad? Well, they did a lot of really gross stuff and, and horrible things to people. And what about all the German Jews? Weren't they victims? Well, you know, you can play that game and, and see them as victims, but then you've got to play in that top model. You got to say that's the way the world is organized. The truth is, uh, the truth for me, what I perceive is, is that in those scenarios where somebody does something to a group of other people, the people that, that it's being done to are bringing the world this amazing gift. They are bringing a higher awareness that we don't want to do this as a species, and we are a learning species. We're slow, but we are learning. We're learning how to coexist in a state of peace. And the only way we're going to come to an absolute resolution of that is when these, these, these situations occur and we go, we don't want that. We're actually in one right now with, with this thing in the Middle East. I mean, we've been, been having stuff with people in the Middle East for a long, long time. But it seems to be coming to a head now. It seems to be taking center stage in our lives. And I, I've been... Y'all don't know who Nostradamus is? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> I used to study that because I was fascinated how somebody mm -hmm. in the what was it, the 14th century yeah. could okay. could uh, could yeah. know what was going to happen centuries later. I love that. I think that's fascinating. And time time you know is an illusion. And how did someone break the code on that? I just love that. <clears throat> and I remember uh, in my reading that that he said there were three antichrists. Doesn't say that in the Bible, but that's what Nostradamus said. And, it, and they pretty much concluded, the interpreters say, the first one was, was Napoleon. Which, and and Nostradamus lived in France, so that would be really important to him. And then the, the second one was Hitler. And he even got, almost got the spelling right in his quatrains on that. Brilliant. Hester, I think, is what he called. Yeah, Hester. Hitler, yeah, something like that. I mean, that's really close. And, and of course, Hitler took over France. Or the, the Nazis did, so that would be really important to him from, uh, from that perspective as well. And the third one is supposed to be something coming out of, of the Muslim world, the Islamic world, according to what he wrote and how it's interpreted. And where do they attack and get the world's attention? Paris. <laughs> wow. Isn't that interesting? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Coincidence. Oh, it's just a coincidence. There you go. So, you know, I, I, and I, you know, that's a diversion to go into to Nostradamus, but the, the point is, is that this is all the evolving nature of our species. And it's dramatic. And people die. 
and there's violence, and there's, now we call it terror, and all of that's happening. And the end result of all this, in pretty much all philosophies, is that there is this millennia of peace, that that's where we're working toward. And what that means is that at some point, the human species is going to say, this isn't working, we have to do something else. And we're finding our way to that answer. So we're on a perfect course. And whatever you perceive the problems of the world are, children starving, child abuse, uh, uh, genocide, whatever it is, it's part of a natural process of us working through our stuff and maturing as a species. So we're on course. We're just not done. So when someone says to me, oh, these bad things that are happening in the world, what do I do? Know that we're working through it. In this class, when I, there was a one wonderful woman here who does everything in her life she can to live off the grid and to be green. We know what that means, right? Yes. She said, and I see all these wasteful people wasting energy and doing all these things. And she said, what do I do? I said, you must know that they're all finding their way to that higher understanding. And she just relaxed. <laughs> I don't know. You mean, because she was judging them. She was finding fault in them. She didn't find fault. They're finding their way. So when you see someone who <laughs> is getting your attention and, and pulling you into a judgment, don't do that. Don't bite. <laughs> Look back at them and say, that's the presence of the divine trying to trick me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do it. I can see you got that. Doing that thing. You know, it's all the call for us to know who we are and to know what world we live in. And we live in the world of the, of the divine presence. That's the highest truth. So we live in the world identifying ourselves as that divine presence. Now what you get out of that is the authority to speak your word. You get, you get to say that the presence of the divine is absolute. Everything that is is contained in this divine presence. It has no edges. It is fully complete. And this is what I am. So I speak from that knowing. Knowing that my word creates my experience. And when I know that and believe that, then whatever I say after it is going to happen. It's just going to happen. Now is it going to happen when you open your eyes? <laughs> Sometimes. Some, some, you know, you can treat a, a, a physical ailment knowing full well that, that health prevails and that's the truth. And absolutely know it and you can open your eyes and, and you can feel the difference in your body and not feel that other thing again. You can do that. I've done it in other people's bodies. I've gone out into the parking lot and <clears throat> it wasn't the hands-on business, but I've gone out in the parking lot and done a treatment over a car that wouldn't start and had it turn over immediately. <clears throat> what is that? It means that I know that what I see and what I know is created and manifest into form of media. One of the projects I give all my practitioner students is to, for a week, to treat for something that they already have. Why would I do that? So that you know what it feels like. To know that you already have it. And then you have that experience of knowing with everything you treat. That make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it really gives you that full experience. So if you've got something wonderful happening in your life, give it a try. Treat it. Because you already know all about it. You know, you know what it looks like. You know, you know, you're, you have a sensory relationship with it. You know how it smells, how it tastes. If it has a taste, you know uh, how it feels. You know how it sounds. And you experience all of those things. And then you know the next thing that some of you or someone else is saying isn't present. Yes, you, yes it is. Here's how I know it is so. Because I can feel it. I can taste it. I can touch it. I can smell it. I can, it it's right here. That's where you go in treatment. So uh, let's see what else do we have here. So we talked about judgment. You cannot have any judgment in your treatments. You never, in your, as we go into the third step, we never, ever, ever um, treat for something to go away. Because we're focusing on the thing. And the focus uh, that we give it is creates it. So trying to get something to go away, it just won't go away if you, if you treat for it to go away. It doesn't work. You have to know what you want in its place. You have to know what you're moving toward, not what you're trying to get away from. 
example because you were really good at creating whatever it is that's already there. So now you must turn away from it if Holmes says turn away from the condition and treat knowing a higher reality and a higher outcome. <coughs> and you give no energy at all to that. Well, what if it's about paying my bills? Well, pay your bills. And know that you always have enough money to pay your bills. What I've noticed, you know, we do that, that uh, treatment for freedom on, on Sunday mornings. Barbara and I are doing that every day. And the money in our bank accounts is just piling up. And we're going, we have to invest this money. It's a good thing. <laughs> you know? Uh, and, and, and amazingly, you know, we, we were going to buy that property in Florida. Mm -hmm. We didn't buy it. But we happened to sell some precious metals we had. At, at a peak point, we didn't know it was a peak point. It just was time to sell the gold, so we sold it. And it's gone down $100 an ounce since then. And in fact, Barbara pulled up the graph today, and she said, see that peak right there? That's where we sold it. And now it's down here. I go, praise God. <laughs> Which is what my life is about. You know, so... Uh, it, those kind of things will happen to you if you have in your consciousness that you are prosperous, that if things are working out, that, that you have the, uh, the answer to everything that you desire. This stuff just works out. But you have to believe it's working out. If you, if you find yourself catching yourself thinking it's not, I call, you know what I call that? A treatment. Don't do that. Don't do that thing where you, 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 your, your mind gets caught or hooked by the idea that something is not working out. You must stay in a state of knowing it is working out. Right now, it's worked out. That's where you keep your mind. Now, one, one caveat to that is don't walk around with your third step telling people that the deal is closed. That, that's light. Because your communication to other people is a reality thing. It's not your work in treatment. Your work in treatment is, yes, it's closed. Yes, it's closed. Yes, it's closed. When somebody says, is it closed? I'm working on it all day long, is a good answer. But don't say, yes, it's closed, and then come to find out it's not. Because you create a conflict there. You know you lied to somebody, and then what happens? You did a lot of treatment work, and it doesn't close. Or whatever. You know, however that works out. So your communications to people still need to be honest while you're doing your treatment work, working it out. Always tell the truth. Always tell the truth and tell it quickly. Yes, absolutely. So, step three is where we're going here. Barbara likes the word affirmation. Holmes used a number of words. One was declaration. I, however, love the word realization. There's nothing wrong with affirmation. Affirming something means that you're making it firm. That's a good thing. That's not a bad thing at all. So affirmations are great things. Declaration is, a, is kind of a powerful term. I declare this is so. Is that, you know, that, that's got some oomph to it, some drama to it, some, you know, some, some power to it. That's nice. But realization is effortless. Think about a time where you realize something. Oh. Oh. I just realized. It doesn't take any effort at all. But it's, it's very real. I mean, it's got the word real in it. You know, so the idea of realizing is so, is so easy. And it should be. It shouldn't be hard to get in your life, in your consciousness, what you desire. It should be easy. So realizing it is not a creative force. It's simply allowing it to be revealed in your life. Wow. I just realized. Isn't that nice? And I find in life that things go much easier when I'm not all attached to the outcome. They say, you know, people who have money can borrow lots of money and can make lots of money. Well, of course they can. They've already got money in their consciousness. They got that worked out. So people want to lend them money. You know, they, they have lots of money to do what they want because they've got that worked out. They realize that they have money, that money's not a problem. 
You know, I've had I've had people in my life who just go, oh, money's easy. Barbara does that. Let it be easy. Why not? So that's a process of realizing. So I like to call my third step a realization. And what I realize is that the thing that I'm desiring is already here. It's right here. I can see it. I can feel it. I can touch it. You know, it's real to me. I try to use all of that when I'm, when I'm working in my third step. Uh, if, if it's a physical thing that I'm manifesting into my life, I want to I know how much it weighs. You know, I want to I feel it's, it's, you know, if it's, if it's gold coins, oh, oh, yeah, very nice. You know, if it's, uh, uh, if, if it's a health issue, I go to that part of my body and I feel the ease with which I move. I feel my breath. I feel the, the, the blood circulating through my body. It just, I feel it. I, I'm, I'm engaged in it. I, it it's it's three-dimensional. It's not just wanting it. I mean, you know, the thing between wanting it and saying that it's so is a really thin line. But for me, you got to work it a bit. you got to really be in it. You know, and then, then you're actually in a place of manifesting it. It's, uh, it's called uh, mental equivalence. Another Trower word. Uh, where the idea is you have to have the mental capacity to, to have this in your life for it to be there. Well, but if that, if that were so, then I could only have what I've already had. No. I can have anything so long as I can have a mental experience of it. Once I can, I can have it. So what I often do when I'm going into a, into a city and I'm speaking somewhere, I'd love to have a couple minutes on the stage before everybody gets in the room so that I can own the room. And my teacher in, in Australia, who was not a religious scientist or a science of mind student, uh, gave me a great way to do that. What I do is I stand on the stage and I look all across the room to the back wall, into the corners, up the side, side walls, ceiling, floor, and I own that space, my space. And all these wonderful people can come in because I let them. <laughs> we have this wonderful time. I'm totally at ease because they are my guests. They are center, but they're, to that day, they're my, my guests. And when I go up and talk to them, I already know them all because they're in my space. And they're there because I want them there. You know, and you, you shift your consciousness around things like that. And you get a different result. One of the on, in the book that I'm writing, I told the story about being in Australia, about um, having had back when I lived in Houston a, a very, very difficult experience when I was struggling in my life. A neighbor asked me to go play tennis. Just, just hit the ball, not, not a game. He was too good for that. But, <laughs> but, but I saw him, you know, get decimated. But we were, we went out to hit the hit the tennis ball back and forth, and I kept missing, I, and to the point, and and. I would keep saying I was sorry. And to the point where I would say I was sorry before I hit the ball. It was ridiculous. And finally I just went home. I said, I can't do this anymore. A um, couple of years later, I was living in Sydney, Australia. And the group that I was with, we, uh, we did our meetings all during the week. And on the weekend, we would go off and do fun things. And one weekend, the idea was, let's go all play. We'll go play tennis. <laughs> I, I can't go. What's wrong? I don't like tennis. Do you, have you ever played? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and my teacher, Ken, saw this going on. He came over and sat down next to me. He says, you know how to be really good at tennis? Okay, you got my attention. He said, you, you go onto the court, and you have a racket, and you have balls, and you own them. You look at the court, and you own the court. On the surface of the court, you own the ground beneath the court, all the way to the center of the earth. You own the, the net, you own the judge's chair, you own the out of bounds all the way to the fence, and you own the sky above you into the heavens. And you own anything that comes into that area, even the person you're playing. You own their tennis racket, you own whatever balls they bring, you own their clothes. <laughs> and you're letting them come out and play with you. 
So I listened to all that, and I looked at everybody and said, okay, we'll go play them. <laughs> so I, I had the blessing of playing uh, with, a, with a guy that was really good. He was, his name was Trevor, and he, he could get hit a tennis ball. And uh, so he and I got a and I said, give me a minute. <laughs> he knew exactly what I was doing. <laughs> but he started serving me the ball. Every ball he served me, hit back. Every single ball. All, we played out there, I don't know, at least a half hour. I hit everything. It all, and it went on the inside of the court, in bounds. You know? hey! <laughs> it was that, oh, that ain't, I was just in this euphoric state. Yeah. And I knew that it was my thinking that created that outcome. It was interesting, when I left Australia, I went back to Miami, where, uh, where I had lived earlier in my life. And... Uh, my mom, I moved in with my mom for, for a short time, and uh, she worked for a bank, and they were having a, they were having a 4th of July uh, holiday party of all the bank employees out of the park. And a bunch of people wanted to play volleyball, and none of them knew me. And so we went out there, and there were picking sides, and one group was all jocks. And one group was everybody else who me. <clears throat> <laughs> and I got them all together and I said, you want to win? Well, sure, but look who's over there. I said, don't matter. This is what we're going to do. And I took them through that whole process of owning the whole thing. Owning the jocks, jocks. <laughs> <laughs> we beat the crap out of them. <laughs> and these guys are there going, what's going on? And they're getting angry and they're yelling at each other. They had no idea what was going on. But we, we beat them. It was quite amazing. I hadn't learned spiritual mind treatment. I had never stepped into a science of mind center. Uh, that happened a, a week or so later. But it was interesting. They had a car that they were raffling off. I didn't have a car. I was using my mom's car. In fact, she was at the picnic. Of course, it was her company. Uh, so so I, I needed a car, and there was this, this Chevy that they were, were uh, going to raffle off. I went over, and I put my hands on that Chevy, and I said, this is my car. And very confidently had my ticket. And we did the raffle, and this old guy won the car. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> so I went over to him and I said, so what are you doing with the car? He said, I don't know. He was the security guard at the, at the, uh, at the bank. He said, I just bought a new Cadillac. Oh, God, I have to buy another car. How much do you want for it? He said, a couple hundred dollars. Okay. And I had a car. <laughs> it was my car. <laughs> 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 That's we create our experience. We do that. The, 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 the idea of spiritual mind is just a formula that actually gets you into the space to know what you choose to know. It helps you get there with authority. So you got that third step of realization. Uh, there are those uh, major things that you're supposed to know when you realize. So let's go through those very quickly. Step three, realization. If you're doing it for yourself, it's personal. In fact, it's personal whether you're doing it for yourself or somebody else. I'm sure you'll do another class on treating for others. Tonight we're treating for ourselves. That means I treat me. I don't treat you. It's, if it's what's going on in my life, even if I want a relationship with you, I do not treat you. I treat me. Meaning <coughs> that if... Well, I'll explain this as we get into it, but it's always about me or I in your treatment. This is a hard one for people sometimes to get. You treat in the present. I now have. I now am. I now experience. Whatever it is, you're not treating that it's coming. We went to a, a minister's gathering in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and there was a lovely group from Unity, a singing group that came and sang for us. And they, they sang a song called uh, Help is on the Way. And they were really good singers, but they sang Help is on the Way. And when they were done, the minister got up and said, I need to tell you no one's coming. <laughs> <laughs> because we don't treat that something's coming. It's already here. It's already here. If you can't see it here now, how's it going to be here? What it's going to be is coming. Yeah, all, yeah, so the deal is... You always treat in the present, which means I now experience this. This is my experience now. 
And people will, well, it's, that's God. Oh, well, yes, it is. In my consciousness, that is so right now. No one's taken that from me. Because that is what the idea, the thought, that knows that it's here now. It's not coming. Don't ever treat something's coming. Don't ever treat something's going to be. Don't treat about tomorrow. Treat about now. We treat in the positive. What does that mean? It means that we treat that it is so, not that it is not so. We treat that it's here, that the thing that we want is, is here. We, treat, we don't treat that something is going away or something has gone away. We, we treat toward something. In neuro-linguistic programming, there's, there's a way to identify people in two basic camps. One is people who move toward what they want and people who move away from what they don't want. In treatment, you must be in a state of moving toward what you want. Your focus must be the thing that you're moving toward, never the thing you're moving away from. You do not treat a pain away. You treat a healthy, vibrant body part or a whole body. You do not treat something away. You, you starve that idea, and you treat the thing that you desire. So you always treat toward the thing that you want, and you treat precisely. What does that mean? That does not mean you treat the details of, of the thing that you desire. It means you treat precise qualities of that experience. Meaning, if you are if you are in need of, of of reliable transportation, you do not treat for the car down on on the lot. You do not find the the, the powder blue uh, convertible and say, uh, my treatment is that I have this car. Don't do that, because you might get that car and find it's a real limit. You treat the qualities of it. Uh, my car is reliable. It has good gas mileage. It uh, starts every time I turn the key. You treat those precise ideas, knowing that whatever it is that you choose has those inherent aspects. And why is this important? Well, I do know somebody that, uh, that treated to be in a relationship with a particular woman. And he got what he, what he treated. <laughs> and the divorce really cost him. <laughs> she was a beauty. <laughs> Don't do it. You know, treat relationship. You treat. You treat uh, compatibility. You treat clarity. You treat respect and honor and honesty. You treat the qualities that you seek. I had a guy with a car here in town. He he was going through uh, uh, a bankruptcy. He had no credit, and he had somebody that was willing to to <laughs> sell him a car. Uh, on on personal credit, uh, and he wanted me to treat that he got that car. I said, I can't do it. Why? I really want that car. I said, because that's not that's not how this works. You get that may not really be the car you want. Uh, I said, I will treat that you have the perfect car. Tell me what the qualities are. I'll know them precisely, and then you'll get you'll have the car that you that will work for you. Okay. <laughs> you didn't get that car. Did the treatment work, but he found a car, the same model gear, the same color, the same whole make, sitting on another lot where a guy gave him credit. And that worked out much better. Now, yeah, the car may have been fine, but I, I, that, I, that just ethically doesn't work for me to treat a specific in that terms of, of a certain item, a certain thing. I will treat the qualities of it specifically. And that way, whatever ends up being the outcome, it's going to work. Okay, see why we do that? So personal, present, positive, and precise. Those are the things that you use to do your third step. In your fifth one? No, I'm Did somebody come up with a fifth one? I think oh, Barbara usually tells the powers. Or, or the other day. The whole thing's powerful. Use meaningful words. That means something to you. Powerful? Okay, well, that's cool. I'm not writing it down because it's not fun. <laughs> Why do we give thanks? Because it's polite. Nice people give thanks. Thank you so much. There's an interesting thing about, about gratitude. Um, 
we always are grateful for what we already have. Well, that's not true now. Come on. You, you could be grateful that, that something's coming. Now, you're only grateful for what you have. If you're grateful, you already have it. And the example would be, I say, Shirley, would you go get me a glass of water? And she said, glad to do it. She gets up and I say, thank you. I don't have a glass of water. I'm not thanking her for the water. I'm thanking her for that she got up and she went off to do that for me. Thank you. When she brings a glass of water and hands it to me, I say, thank you. For the water. They're different things. When we're saying thank you, it's for something we have. Now, the, 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 it's true that a, a promise could be said, you could offer gratitude for a promise, but it's not common. Most of the things in your life you're grateful for, you already have them. So when in a treatment you have done your steps, you've gone through recognition of the divine presence, uh, your uh, identification as that presence with authority, you realize the truth of your life and you move into the fourth step and you're grateful. You're telling yourself you already have it. And did you not in present tense say you have it? Right. You did. You already said you have it. So when you say, I'm grateful for it, I'm not grateful for the promise of it. I'm telling myself that I already have it. And that is an element that actually adds to the manifestation of my knowing that you already have it. So when you're saying you're thankful for it, <coughs> see it. See the thing and, and own the thing that you are grateful for. If it's grateful for a healthy body, own that healthy body. Do not end your treatment with, oh, it's going to hurt to move. Or whatever. <laughs> you know, don't. Own it. Be grateful for it because it's real. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And then the, uh, the final step, the last step, is release. I guess I should write that down. One interesting thing is that these last two steps were not homes. They were one of his uh, students. Man named uh, um, Oren Mullen, a minister in Oakland, California. He said his students were having a little trouble getting to hear. But that's what Holmes did. He did recognition, unification, and declarations, I think what he called them then. And that was his work. And when he was done there, he was done. He, 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 really, he realized that he was done. But he said his students, uh, Mullen said his students really liked the idea of giving thanks for it. And then this idea of release came up. And at home said, okay, that'll work. Uh, so we, it became a five-step. I don't know if you've heard, but there are treatment processes as many as 12 steps. <laughs> I know, I don't need that. This works just fine. So the release idea is that if you do the first four steps and you don't let it go, you are telling yourself that it can only happen by means that you can experience, that you can understand. Something, can, example, the, the a logical one is, I need more money in my life, obviously I need a raise. As though a raise is the only way you can have more money in your life. Actually, there are infinite ways to have more money in your life. And if you treat knowing that you have more money in your life, and you don't let it go, then it's got to happen by a way that you've already experienced. Which is likely that you'll, that you'll expect to get a raise. Will you get a raise? Maybe. But there's also all these other possibilities for flow into your life that you're, that you're blocking out. Because you're relying on your consciousness and your understanding to make that outcome so. So you don't want to do that. At the end of the treatment, you know what is so. You've done this third step. You've got this thing down. You know it's so. You're grateful for it. And you let it go. Because it's not yours to figure out. Edwin Gaines is notorious for saying, how is none of your business. And if you can't let it go, if you have to keep control of it, then it can only happen by means of your consciousness. Whereas if you do let it go, now it's open to the entire universe and every possibility, an infinite number of possibilities on how that can be resolved. 
It's like it goes back to the reading, <coughs> the, the, the man with the $15 a week and the $30 and $100 a week. It's their own limited perspective of their world that they're getting. Right. You know, it's, it's their consciousness. It's their, what their norm is. Right. And they're limited. And it is your consciousness, but you want your consciousness to know the outcome only. You do want to know that. You want to have a sense of how it's going to look, how it's going to work. But how that shows up in your life is none of your business, and you must release it to allow it to show up by whatever means it chooses, and the, and the universe chooses, or that divine presence chooses in all of it, its infinite presence to bring back and to reflect back into your life. And they were their own limiting factors. We are always our own limiting factors. Always. And the idea of release is to get out of the way and let it happen. And then have a great story. <laughs> because you may get the raise, and that's a nice little story. Or you may have an aunt you didn't even know you had. Die and leave you three million bucks. Why limit it? Why limit it? Let the universe handle this. Just know what it is that you're calling into your life. What you're realizing. Be clear about that. That's your work. Be clear about what it is that's in your life. Claim that with all of your heart and all of your being. Claim it and then get out of the way and let it show up. Now that doesn't mean you don't, you don't work at it. It doesn't mean that you don't keep your eyes open. I, I've done treatment work for people and, and they didn't get it when it showed up. You know, the next natural thing happened and they, they came back and it didn't, didn't work. What do you mean it didn't work? Well, you treated that, that I would be in a, a, a loving, healthy relationship. And my ex called. Well, maybe you need to clean up your stuff with your ex so that you know how to be in an honest relationship. Maybe that's why they showed up. You know? It all fits. <coughs> and it all works. The perfection of life is it always works. It's our ability to see it that is sometimes limited. Yes. I'm just curious as to whether it's, it's appropriate to um, do more than one focus on your treatment, like if you're treating yourself. Can you do Good question. More than, more than oh, one? that's an excellent question. Okay. Everybody, this, this everybody has a laundry list of things <laughs> they would like to have happen in their lives. What I recommend is learning this model. Do one thing. Do one thing. Let Just that be. Until it happens. Yeah, and stay with it till it happens. And it's happening based on your ability to know it's so. And don't pick the hardest one. This isn't a, this isn't a, a grand challenge. It's about demonstrating that it works. So pick something reasonable and let it show up. You know, do the steps. Be clear. Do it again and again and again and again. And Holmes says those aren't doing additional treatments. It's all one treatment. Just keep treating, keep treating. <clears throat> Get up in the morning, do your treatment. I do mine in the morning. Do it with the way you want. If you do it at night, some people prefer that. I like to do it in the morning and then move into my day with that. But, but my work is always that, that I stay with it till it's done. I, I think there comes a point where you can do that. You can bring more than one idea into it. But really, I like to learn this. I like to teach this and ask people to learn how to do this one thing at a time. You know, really, truly, and then watch it show up. It's beautiful. Yes. So, I was in the prosperity class. Yes. And love the the gratitude letter to my CSA uh -huh. every morning. Um, and you still doing it? Oh yeah. Cool. Um, and um, so, <coughs> how does this? This feels very similar to the gratitude letter. The, I mean, this feels. Of, Treatment. Sure, we, we do our gratitude, we do our, our CSO meeting first thing, and, and then we visualize on it, and then we do a spiritual mind treatment. You know, so, yeah. you know, it's, so it's not, it's not, uh, I, I, the, the whole idea of the letter just brings other forms into it, writing, yeah. reading, yeah. you know, so. No, no, no. Mm. Whatever's there in that day. Yeah. You know, I, I don't, I don't. Um, I don't have to treat things over and over again. I have specifically added the first two steps Good. to my gratitude letter. That's great. That's great. So do your letter and then do your, do do a treatment. And don't write the treatment. Just just speak the treatment. Just speak it in your life. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And uh, when we finished the treatment, we ended with the, the, the treatment for, for freedom and the, the five points of power. That's how we ended. And we don't say, and so it is, which is the natural way to end the treatment, right. which is our, just in our culture. And so it is means this is so, uh, it's so. Uh, we're done. Yes? Is it okay to write your treatment? Some people write. That totally works for me. Some people write, sure. Absolutely. No, there's no wrong way to do this. It, the idea is... It's not about the words, it's about your consciousness. It's about owning that high level of knowing that allows that thing that you're perceiving to be manifested in a visible form. To Does show up in your mind. Avoid distractions However it works for you, you've got it down. Anything else? Boy, you have put up with a lot of talking. Thank you so much. It has been a delight to be with you. Yes, thank you. Now we do our, our uh, receiving for our center. <clears throat> Let me tell you about how much did, who got something good to use today? Okay. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. If you think you got something good, then this is your opportunity to balance that. This idea of flow is important. It's not just about supporting the center. It's really about demonstrating to yourself that you receive something and you're giving something that experience and expression. And I know some of you are, are titers and you, you put in, you send in checks and all that good stuff, so I have no stuff on what goes in the basket tonight, but it's really important that you be in the dynamic flow if you're going to get this stuff. If you're going to make this work in your life, you can't just take it. You've got to be in the dynamic flow. And I know that you are. I just want to thank you for that. So know with me, right here and right now, that the presence of the divine is absolute. It has revealed itself within our conversation tonight. It is the highest and most truthful thing that we know. That spirit exists. It exists as us. We are the creative form and fortune of our lives. We are awesome in our power by knowing the truth of who we are by revealing and realizing that which we are so beautifully in mind, our lives unfold in perfection. And knowing that this is so, we simply allow this moment to be a moment of gratitude, a moment of being in that dynamic flow, of demonstrating our giving nature, and of supporting our center with our love and our time and our money. It's all good. So I'd ask everyone Please take a moment, just a moment, with the basket that comes to you. And if you have something physical to put in it, please put it in there in a very, in a very conscious way. And if you are not putting something physical in it, then put some energy in it, some loving energy, and feel about how much you love this center and how important it is in your life. And let's do this in the silence. gifts are blessed. I know that the, this action is a spiritual action of giving and receiving, and that we are in that dynamic flow of spirit. And I claim for everyone in this class that only good can come to us for the good work that we are doing. And I know for those that have placed gifts, financial gifts, into these baskets, that each one is blessed. And I offer this special blessing tonight for this continued support for this place and for all that it does. I am so grateful and so joyously happy for who we are and what we do. And I let this be our truth right here, right now, and always. As we move off to whatever is next, I know that we leave here safely and
and joyously and return to do more when the right time comes. It's all good. It's all God. And so it is. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.